Welcome folks, we are going to focus on the Van Hiller levels of geometric reasoning and for the next few videos and hopefully this helps you in understanding what we mean when we talk about geometric reasoning and why children actually find geometry difficult to cope with. I'm just collecting my highlighter if I want to make notes. Let's start. That is Pierre van Hiller. Pierre and his wife, Dina van Hiller Geltoff, um, was studying in 1957 for their doctoral dissertations at the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. They studied under a very, very famous mathematician, Hans Freudenthal. Most of you might have heard of the Freudenthal Institute. That institute is located in the Netherlands and has made enormous contributions to mathematical learning and what we know as math teachers about the teaching of mathematics. Okay, two Dutch educators, as I said, in the 50s developed their theory of geometric reasoning along lines of structure for reasoning. So they structured these as the levels of geometric reasoning. Um, in their dissertations. Educators of the former Soviet Union learned of the Van Hiller researchers and in 1960 changed their geometric curric geometry curriculum to facilitate what the Van Hillers have found in their research. This research was only taken up in the United States and possibly the rest of the world during the 1980s. Okay, so you can see that's 30 years almost from when it was developed that it actually make an impact globally, people buying into or reading about their research. Now, in a nutshell, what we see in front of you there is what the levels are that they have proposed. The first level they're gonna, we're going to talk about is visualization, then analysis, then informal deduction, and that will form the basis of this video. The next video, we will look at formal deduction and rigor as the last two levels in the geometric uh, reasoning model as proposed by the Van Hillers. Okay, so that's a wide, you can see now here, they're talking about shape. These two levels intersect at classes of shapes. This we're going to talk about uh, suggestions for teaching. Then the next two levels intersect at the properties of shapes. The next two at the relationships among the properties. And then the deductive system of properties um, is the last intersection that we'll talk about. Now these intersections we're going to talk about suggestions for teaching. If a child is at level 1, how do we get them to uh, at level naught? How do we get them to level 1? By the way, certain books start at level 1 and finishes at level 5. Okay? Our work will start at level naught and finish at level 4. We're going to use the representation of the model as such. So let's start with level naught, the level of visualization that uh, the Van Hillers speak about. What is this about? Well, students can name and reorganize shapes on this level only by their appearance, but cannot specifically identify, the key word here is cannot identify, the properties of shapes. So they go by what they see. It is a square because it looks like a square. It is a circle because it looks like a circle. Although they may be able to recognize characteristics, folks, they do not use them for recognition and for sorting. Okay, so the properties are not even Featuring at this level, it is purely functioning at the visual level. So there, a rectangle looks uh, a rectangle. The, the, the shape is a rectangle, 
because it looks like a door. So if you as a teacher use this in class and say, let's look around us where we can find rectangles and you use the door as an example, that is the concept image that the child has at the level of visualization of what a door is, or what a rectangle is. It's a rectangle because it looks like a door. So let's look at that. This is not a triangle. That is not a triangle. This is a triangle. And that could possibly be a triangle to a child. They might have doubts still. This is definitely not a triangle. This is also not a triangle. And this is not a triangle. Why is that the case, folks? The most common figure that we use as teachers is placing a triangle in this orientation and just out of force of habit, I think, we draw this equilateral triangle and we represent that as a triangle to a child. So the reasoning here is based on mental prototypical shapes only. What the child has as a mental picture of what a figure is determines when they recognize that figure. So having said that, this is definitely a square. That is not. And you can think about why this is not. Think about why this set of figures are so distinct for a child that's operating at the visual level naught. And that the answer in that is the orientation of the shape. So if we start teaching triangles and we stick to triangles that look like this one, the child won't see that as a triangle because it doesn't look like this. None of these look like that. This a triangle? Hmm. That a triangle? No. No ways. Because it doesn't look like that. Okay. This a square. That not a square. Has to do with the fact that the orientation is different. So a high attention is paid to orientation and to symmetry in this figure. Big idea. Symmetry in the figure. If we don't represent alternative forms of that, that is what remains in the child's head as being a triangle or being a square. So if you ask a child, you give, put that shape on the board and you start doing this with the shape. Now we as maths teachers know what's happening here. We are rotating the shape around a certain center. But what will the child explain to you? The child will say, it's turning. That's all that will happen here. It is turning. The shape is not rotating. None of the semantic density of the notion of rotation is present here. The shape has just turned. The student can then do what? Identify, compare and sort shapes. Key thing here, on the basis of their appearance as a whole. So again, the notion of appearance at level naught. Solves problems using general properties and techniques. Example of that is overlaying and actually taking out and measuring things. Um, that's how they deal with problem solving at level naught. Uses informal language, a learner at level naught does not use the mathematical registry for that particular shape or property that you're talking about and does not analyze in terms of the components of the shape. So again, the door example. A door is a rectangle. So something that lies flat is not a rectangle because its orientation is different. Um, its measurements might be different as well. Okay, but the child does not use the components of the particular shape to reason about it. So the language at the visual level, folks, serve to make possible communication for the whole group about the structures that the students or the learners observe. The vocabulary represents the figures, representing the figures, help in describing 
those figures. Any misconceptions identified may be clarified by the use of the appropriate language. Now, <coughs> through our work with these levels, and even when we get to the habits of mind, language is important. Giving the child the language to describe what they are observing and developing that language, the sophistication of that language is very important. The language of the next level, example congruence, will not be understood by students who are on the visual level. Okay, so we need to, as teachers, be aware of that. Develop the language that you can induct them into the next level of reasoning. Okay, so here we go. The suggestions for instructions using visualization is sorting, identifying, and describing shapes. Big, three big things. Identify, sort, and describe. Now, by sorting, we mean... Does this fall under the idea of a rectangle? Does this fall under the idea of a quadrilateral? Okay, and identifying that it does, and then describing the shape itself. Manipulating physical models, that's more or less what I just described. Seeing different sizes and sizes and orientations of the same shape. Now remember that equilateral triangle, turn it on one of its vertices, stretch it a bit, it's still a triangle. Okay, so why do we do this? So that to distinguish, the learner distinguishes the characteristic of the shapes and the features that are relevant and those that are not relevant to the shape being classified as a particular shape. Building, drawing, making, putting together and taking apart shapes. Now, teachers at, at the lower level can use straws or toothpicks and press stick and, and ask kids to build various shapes from it. What teachers at primary school and possibly at a, a level, uh, if you identify a child at level north, a good tool to use is the tool of the tangram because it allows you to put together shapes and also to take them apart. So working with examples of as well <laughs> examples of as well as non-examples of the idea of variation. Is it an example of a triangle? This is not an example of a triangle, this is. So that is key in moving from the visual to the next level, which is analysis level one. Let's see what this is about. Learners here begin to identify properties of shapes and learn to use the appropriate vocabulary related to those properties, but do not make connections between different shapes and their properties. So at level one, the analysis level, a child will be able to tell you what a square is what the properties of the square will be, but cannot talk about the square and the rhombus in the same language, or the square and a rectangle. Can talk about a whole collection of rectangles, but not across the, um, the, the, the notions of different quadrilaterals. So irrelevant features such as size orientation becomes less important here. Okay, size an orientation fades into the background because we're now talking about properties and then um, the properties that belongs to a collection or a family of shapes. So those become less important as learners are able to focus on all shapes within a family or a class of shapes. So they can talk about different rectangles, about different triangles, about different squares. Um, but they cannot talk about the difference between a square and a rectangle. So they're able to think about what properties make a rectangle. Learners at this level are being able to talk about the relationship between shapes and their properties. Okay, let's have a look. 
So for the learner, the blue and the red will be squares. The orientation, remember, we said fades in the background. These two shapes, the rhombus, and this is not a special form of a square. So they can't talk across these two. They can talk within that family only. Okay. Students identify the properties and see it as a class of shapes. It is a rectangle because it has one long set of sides and one short set of sides. And opposite sides are parallel and, and, and. So they can talk about the properties within a class, but not across classes of shapes. What can the student do? They recognize and describe the shape in terms of its properties. Okay, that's the first thing. They discover properties experimentally by observing, by measuring, by drawing, and by modeling those properties. Okay, they use the formal language and symbols related to the particular shape, but they do not use sufficient definitions. At this level, they can make a list of the properties of a class of shapes. Okay, folks, very important. They do not see a need for proof of generalizations discovered empirically. So they cannot reason inductively um, at this point of their journey in geometry. Well, what are the suggestions for instructions that uses the analysis of shapes? Let's see. Shifting from simple identification to properties, using concrete or virtual models to define, measure, observe, and change properties. So here we're moving from shifting from the simple identification of a shape to the properties of the shape in a class of shapes. And we need to be aware that the next level, they need those properties to argue and to compare with one another to be able to say, but hang on, a parallelogram is not a rectangle or a rectangle is not a parallelogram, whatever the case might be. Okay, I'm just using that as an example I'm, as I'm thinking. So they're using models or technology to focus on defining properties, making property lists and discussing sufficient and necessary conditions to define a shape. Now this latter is big. The sufficient and the necessary properties that a quadrilateral has to possess to be a square, to be a rhombus, to be a trapezium, to be a kite. Okay, this is where it happens at the level of analysis. They do problem solving. They include tasks in which properties of shapes are important components of the task. Now you'll find that in textbooks that once you've studied quadrilaterals, they have all the quadrilaterals listed and all the properties of the quadrilaterals and you go and tick which properties belong where. So classifying using properties of shapes becomes important at the analysis level because that gives access to the level that is following this level. Now at this level then, having gone through all of that, a child will talk about this as a rotation. The figure is rotating. Okay, they will talk about that as a reflection of the blue figure in the mirror line, which lies obliquely drawn the black line. And then also the properties of um, such a reflection and such a rotation become important. So you need a center of um, rotation or you need a mirror line, but that the property is that the distance to the mirror line is the same on either side of the mirror line. Another nice example here would be if we look at this net that's been developed if we are of a set of six squares, that that eventually, if we close the net, becomes a cube. Okay, so a cube is consisting of six congruent 
um, squares that this is on a plane and this is 3D what we've spoken about in a previous video the, 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 the transformation from 2D to 3D so a task that relates two dimensional shapes to three dimensional shapes in other words the net of these um, figures these 3D figures if we open them up what does it look like now folks this becomes important for later learning we know in calculus it's important to be able to open a shape up to find optimum values. So finding areas of irregular shapes also helps. The shapes are irregular. So you have a shape that looks like this. Which other shapes can you apply to calculate that area with? Uh, uh, f figures like that fu uh, functions on the level of analysis and then induct a child into the next level. So let's look at an activity. Look at those shapes. Which are polygons? Which are not polygons? Now to be able to answer this, the child has to have a very clear and unambiguous understanding of what a polygon is. Okay, so how do we answer the question? The child might point and say, hmm, this figure is a polygon, that's a polygon that's a polygon but these funny shapes that we're working with they're not and some of them are so how do we then get to why are the ones that you chose polygons now if I was you pause the video at this point and answer the first question and then try and find the reasons why you chose them as polygons pause the video do that and then unpause the video and follow the discussion after that. Okay, let's see. What's the definition of a polygon? Well, be careful. I'm, I'm choosing two definitions here. Got them online. Online resources are incredible to use. But folks, you've got to be careful. As a teacher, you have to be able to see what the definition say, says and also see what it's not saying. The first definition I got is a polygon is any two-dimensional shape formed by straight lines. Okay, so what does it mean? It means this is not a polygon and that is not a polygon. The rest of them are. Okay, so there's something wrong with this definition. There's something missing from this definition. Um, that we need to be aware of as teachers. So let's look at another definition. A polygon is a plane figure, while well, it's saying it exists in two-dimensional space, that is described by a finite number of straight line segments, no difference between the two. Let me just say something about straight line segments, folks. In the geometry class, the definition of a line is a straight geometric object. So to say, to talk in the geometry class of a straight line is saying the same thing twice. It's saying that's a female woman. A line, by its definition, is a straight object. Okay, so number of line segments. Now look at this. This is missing. Connected to form a closed shape. That's not a closed shape, so that is not a polygon. If we go by the first definition, working definition for a polygon, then that was a polygon because it consists of three straight lines, to use their language. But the definition is incomplete. The definition has to specify that it's a closed shape for it to be a polygon. So be careful of the definitions that you find online. Okay, be very, very discriminatory um, and read three or four or five definitions and then see what the properties are that are foregrounded as important. How many polygons, folks, can you find in this figure? Now, I want you to pause the video again to find as many polygons as you can in that figure now that you know the definition. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to model practice to you. So if you are working with polygons and children don't know what it is, 
this is a nice idea for you to find out and to develop the notion of a polygon. So as you work, also try to discover a systematic way to finding a list of the polygons in the figure. Please pause the video now, do that, and then we'll come back and talk. Okay, let's see. While we're looking at this, I want you to think of which Van Hiller level you are operating on when you answer this question. I hope you found that there's 13 polygons. Okay, what are they? Let's have a look. The first one, four small triangles, each defined by one side of the rectangle and two halves of the diagonals. So that will be X, V, Y, Y, V, Z, Z, V, W, W, V, X. That brings you the four triangles. Okay, the next shape possibly is four pentagons, each a complement of one of the small triangles. Now, folks, what is a complement in mathematics? A complement of this triangle here. Let's just talk about looking at the figure. The complement of triangle XVW is what is not in that triangle, but in the figure. So that complement will be XW, Z, Y, V. So one, two, three, four, five. There's four of those triangles. So there must be four pentagons, five-sided figures. So, so far, we're on eight. There's five we still need to talk about. Well, four large triangles, each defined by two sides of the rectangle and one of the diagonals. Two sides of the rectangle, one of the diagonals. So there's one, there's two, there's three, and there's four, four of those. So, so far we are on 12. Don't forget the rectangle. There's a rectangle in there as well. So your score would be that there is, there's eight plus one plus four. Four figures have five sides, one figure has four sides, eight figures have three sides. Okay. So, folks, very important then, what Van Hiller level were you functioning on? Is it Van Hiller level 0? Is it Van Hiller level 1? What level is this? Well, what did you do? You reasoned with the properties of the shape to find shapes across the figure that you have been given. So, you're functioning at the level where you are using those properties across different figures. Okay, so polygons, what are they now? They are made of connecting line segments. Each segment touches exactly two other segments, one at each of its end points. They are closed. They divide the plane into two distinct regions, an inside and an outside. Those are things that you can use when you talk about polygons. So let's see the type of polygons that we come across. We have convex polygons. We have concave polygons. The difference between the two of those type of polygons, simple polygons we call them by the way, is that one of the angles, this angle here, is larger than 180. That makes it concave. Else it is convex. Then we come across those two classifications, we get equilateral polynomials, meaning the sides are all equal to one another, across convex and across concave. Then you get a regular convex figure. The word regular means all sides are equal. Equilateral triangle, square. This is a pentagon with five equal sides, so it's called a regular pentagon. The word regular has meaning here. It means sides are equal. Here you have a regular star. All the sides, all the sides in the star are equal to each other. Okay, or we can talk about an equiangular instead of equilateral, 
Lateral refers to sides. Anguia, angular refers to the angles. So all the angles in the polygon are equal to one another. You can see now that we're talking and using the properties, either angular or angu angle properties or side properties of the shape. Then we also get a cyclic polynomial, in this case a cyclic quadrilateral. This here is a cyclic triangle. This is a cyclic regular pentagon. So the language is now developed to talk about the semantics of the shape, the semantic density of the shape. If I talk about an equilateral triangle, just the word equilateral has a lot of concepts that is condensed in that one idea of equilateral triangle. Okay, level two is our next level, the level of informal deduction and abstraction. This level, like all the other levels, are also very important um, in our journey through geometric reasoning. Here learners are able to recognize relationship between and amongst properties, between and among properties of shapes or classes of shapes. So now they can talk about rectangles and compare them to squares. Rhombi compared to squares. Parallelograms compared to trapeziums. They can now cross-reference and are able to follow logical arguments that use these properties. So here there's properties that are standing separate and there's an, in, there's an intersection of properties. So those relationships are now logically ordered. Learners at this level can distinguish between the necessary and sufficient conditions for a concept to exist. They can also form abstract definitions and classify figures by elaborating on those interrelationships. A student at this level may define a square as a rectangle with consecutive sides congruent. Okay, you can see across the figures how they are making those connections. They may argue that the sum of the measures of an interior angles of a pentagon is three times the sum of the measures of the angles in a triangle and four times the sum of the measures of the angle in a hexagon by using picture and reasoning why the angles of the triangles account for all the other angles in the figures. Now folks, <coughs> excuse me, if we look at a square, a square can be divided into various triangles, a pentagon can be divided into various triangles, a hexagon. All figures can basically be divided into triangles and that's a nice idea to use when you teach the properties and the areas of these shapes. So logical implications and class inclusions, such as a square being a type of rectangle, are understood at this level. The role of significance of formal deduction, however, is not understood at level two. So what can the student do? The student can define a figure using minimum sufficient sets of properties. The student can give informal arguments and discovers new properties by deduction. The student follows and can supply parts of a deductive argument and does not grasp the meaning of the axiomatic system or see the interrelationship between networks of theorems. So in this level, they talk across classes of shapes. Okay, but they cannot grasp the meaning of the axiomatic system or see the interrelationships between networks of theorems regarding those shapes. Just for us that don't know, an axiom is a basically a rule that you can always assume true in mathematics. An axiomatic system is any set of axioms from which some or all axioms can be used in conjunction to logically derive theorems. A theory consisting of an axiomatic system and all of its derived theorems. Okay, that's what a theory consists of. So, for example, if we look at that, 
the informal deduction level of abstraction. If you look at that figure, if I know how to find the area of a rectangle, I can find the area of a triangle. The area of a triangle is half base times height. Now folks, pause the video here and see if you can actually derive that from this diagram. Okay, so let's look at the suggestions of instruction using informal deduction. You're doing problem solving, including tasks in which the properties of shapes are important components. Using models and property lists and discussing which group of properties constitute the necessary and sufficient condition for a shape to be classified across contexts or across different classes of shapes or within a particular class of shapes. So the minimum and sufficient properties. Using informal or deductive language, all, some, none, if, then, what, if, if and only if. So investigating certain relationships amongst polygons to establish if they, the converse is indeed valid. Example, if a quadrilateral is a rectangle, it must have four right angles. If a quadrilateral has four right angles, the converse must it be a rectangle. Now we know the answer to that, but that's a very good example of how you use the converse, the properties in the converse form. And then using models as drawings, including dynamic software, as tools to look for generalizations and non-examples of the thing that you're working with. Okay, so let's go back to our polygons. We get those different polygons. We get concave polygons. Now remember concave and convex. A polygon that has an angle measuring more than 180 is concave. These are all concave polygons. These are regular polygons. They're regular because their side lengths are equal. So the word regular polygon, you can see again the semantic density of that concept. Equal sides. The figure is a closed figure. It's connected. That's why it's a polygon. It divides the, the plane into two parts, the interior and the exterior. And then a polygon has line symmetry. The reflection symmetry, it possesses reflection symmetry. A polygon can also possess rotational symmetry, for that matter. So if you can fold it along one of its lines, so that the two halves match exactly, this folding line is called the line of symmetry of that particular polygon. Okay, so we can't fold that way across the regular um, pentagon because that won't fit on that. That is a quadrilateral, this is a triangle. We have that as a line. Oops, it's a bit skew, but that's a line of symmetry as indicated over there. Okay, so yeah, polygons can be divided into groups according to their properties. Consider the polygons below. Convex, simple, plain. Okay, so they can now start talking about grouping them according to the properties that they have across the shapes. So working with relational levels of examples. We've seen this before. This Collectively, they are parallelograms, which then becomes rectangles, of which a subset is a square, or become rhombuses, of which the subset is a square. The intersection of those properties. Show that the angles in a planar triangle add up to 180 degrees. How will you as a teacher teach that property to learners? And then... How is that property different if you work on a sphere? Spherical triangles, how are they different from planar triangles? And even worse, what happens to the sum of the angles of a triangle if you move into hyperbolic space? Okay, so these are type of activities that stimulates the informal deduction and abstraction and reasoning in a child to move to the next level of the Van, Hiller, um, the Van Hiller levels of geometric reasoning. Let's revisit the first three levels. 
and discuss them to wrap up this first session on the Van Hiller levels. We're going to tabulate the information. We're going to look at the object of thought on each level. We're going to talk about the structure of the thinking and then maybe an example or two to just clarify what that means. Now first, at the Van Hiller level, not the visual level, the individual figure is what's foregrounded as important. It works with one figure and the one figure only. The idea of the rectangle um, looking like the door and not looking like a box of matches if you look at it from the side. It's only focusing on the door. The level of analysis, excuse me, we went from the individual figure looking at the properties in a class of figures. So all rectangles then become parallelograms and so forth. Then for level two, information deduction and abstraction, we start working for the first time with definitions of the classes of figures. Okay, so that's your object of thought. Level naught, the individual figure. Level two, the classes of figure, but the definitions still stay within a class. And at level two, we work the definitions of the classes of figures. So at that level, we start looking across um, different properties and definitions. Then the structure of the thinking at von Hiller level naught is purely visual. It is naming, it is visual sorting, the orientation is important, and the way the shape looks is important. So visual recognition is key there. At level one analysis, the structure of thinking recognizes the properties as characteristics of classes. So we can look at a set of squares or a family of squares and then talk about their properties which we can't do on the visual level. At level two, we begin to notice the relationships between those properties and between classes. We notice them, we don't use them to construct arguments uh, and, and construct proofs and that type of thing yet. So the examples, parallelograms go together because they look the same and only a certain parallelogram. A parallelogram that's orientated in a specific way. If it's orientated differently, no longer a parallelogram. Rectangles, squares and rhombi are thus not, also not parallelograms because they don't look like them. At the level of analysis, an example, they start associating a parallelogram with its properties. Opposite sides equal, opposite angles equal, diagonals bisecting one another, opposite sides parallel, etc. So all rectangles is still, uh, uh, sorry, a rectangle is still not a parallelogram because it has right angles which the parallelogram does not have. So a square will also not be seen as a rhombus because of the absence of the 90 or, or yeah, a rhombus won't be seen as a, a special type of square because of the absence of 90 degree angles. Level two examples, opposite sides are equal imply opposite sides um, parallel or opposite sides equal imply opposite sides parallel or opposite sides parallel imply opposite sides equal or opposite angles equal imply opposite sides are equal. So bisecting diagonals imply half turn symmetry in the intersection point. Okay, so you can see the difference between the three levels that's in front of us at the moment. Level two, by far the most sophisticated um, form of reasoning. Now, I just want to remind us of what we said earlier, that the 40% of our learners that have gone through a high school uh, geometry curriculum are not even on level two. Okay, so teachers, training teachers, we really need to think about what it is that we're doing that will promote the geometric reasoning. I'm going to end off this uh, video slides uh, presentation by quoting Pierre van Hiller. And it's a very powerful definition, a very powerful quote. He says, the definition of a concept is only possible 
if one knows to some extent the thing that is to be defined. Now folks, that quote I'll come back to when we look at the phases of learning. It's a very important quote. If you learned something from this video, please like it, please comment in the box below and subscribe to the channel to get notices of any future videos that I will post.